Hello and welcome to Always Bored Never Boring. Recently I received a review copy of Against the Ogre Horde, the latest expansion for Avalon Hill's new edition of HeroQuest. It's absolutely packed with cool new things, so I decided to make a series of videos highlighting some of the more notable features. We have already done the unboxing and initial review, going through most of the new rules, and we have taken a closer look at the Druid Hero. Today, we are going to take a deep dive into something that is entirely new for this expansion, the head-to-head -head skirmish mode. I have to say, this is a really unusual addition. What Avalon Hill have done is take the basic combat system of the game, roll skulls to hit, roll shields to block, and then they have layered on a few little embellishments to increase the tactical options before finally adding some bare bones, very basic, yeah, basic. rules for building a team that is in some vague hand wavy kind of way, a bit balanced against any other team you might create. And it's neat, as long as you don't expect too much from it. This is HeroQuest. The combat was designed to be instantly accessible, fast paced and fun. It wasn't designed to hold up an entire skirmish game. The fact the whole thing doesn't crumble like cracker bread is nothing short of a miracle. But, what exactly is this new game mode, and why does it even exist? Well, the original Against the Ogre Horde expansion included a quest line that was just seven missions. Avalon Hill have, pretty faithfully, almost to a fault, recreated that seven part quest in this new edition. However, they wanted to bring the mission count up to ten, so they conceived this idea of a prequel of sorts, three adventures in which our heroes would enter the World's End tournament and battle their way to the top tier to prove their worth and earn the respect of an ogre who can help them with their quest. Each of the three missions involves one or more bouts in the arena, we will talk more about that in my next video, and only after completing all the bouts successfully will the heroes gain the information they need so they can start the quest proper. And it should be noted, Avalon Hill have included a note in this expansion to say that if you don't fancy the arena stuff, just skip it, go straight to Quest 4 and play through the quest line from the original edition of the expansion. However, in addition to using the arena mode for the first three missions in the quest, you can also play it as a standalone minigame, which is fun. Don't get me wrong, this isn't going to blow your socks off with how awesome it is, but having another game mode an even quicker and easier way to get out your HeroQuest toys and roll some dice, a genuine skirmish game that you can play with non-gamers and kids with no trouble at all. Well, that's no bad thing. I have to admit, just the inclusion of an arena mode gets me a little misty-eyed, because it feels like a little throwback to a bygone age. In fact, hold up, insert a record scratch here and let's rewind the clock to 1989, when the first edition of the first European edition of HeroQuest emerged from under my Christmas tree. That edition of the game did not include the trial, which was a subsequent addition to the quest book to serve as a type of trainer scenario. The first edition had the maze, which I've talked about on the channel previously. And before heroes ever set foot in that maze, they had to learn how to fight. They did that in, yes, the arena. The idea was, heroes were supposed to set themselves up in the central room of the board, a magical arena created by Mentor, along with five goblins, and then they slugged it out to the death. This was to teach the heroes how to move and fight. It was also to teach them that every hero was out for themselves because it was a last character standing contest. The heroes were absolutely supposed to beat each other to death. And at the end of that fight, the magical arena would restore all the heroes to full health, ready to begin their adventure. Already nursing scars, and a few grudges that would spill over into regular gameplay. Of course, this was just a thematic way to help new players learn the rules, not a fleshed out game mode like we have here. But even so, it does sort of feel like this new arena mode is a little nod to HeroQuest's storied history. Regardless, enough with the history lessons, let's see how this arena mode works. First of all, we set up the battlefield. We place the main arena and the two antechambers. The antechamber with the cross swords is where the challengers enter, that's the good guys. The other antechamber is where the… you know what? You can figure it out. Next, we place the two double doors. Then we place two stone piles, which are just to break up the open space a little. 
we place two treasure chests, like so. And finally, we place six trophy tiles face down, like so. There are 10 trophy tiles in total. You shuffle them and use only six. The rest go back in the box. So, while the official arena layout is always the same, there is a small amount of variability regarding which trophy tiles are in play. Next, players form their teams. If you are playing through the quest, the challenger team comprises the heroes and any allies they may have, while the rival defender team will be whichever monsters are included on the map for that particular mission. However, if you are playing the skirmish mode as a standalone gaming experience, you can build your teams from any hero quest miniatures you have in your collection using a rudimentary point system. Any hero has a power rating of 1, to which you add the strength of their most powerful attack. So an elf who has access to the wind spells would be power 6, because their base power is 1 and their most powerful attack is the genie spell which is attack 5. The barbarian with a broadsword would be power 4. Monster power ratings are equal to just their highest attack value, so an orc archer is power 3, a goblin is power 2, and so on. Players build their teams using this system, which seems more than a little bit loosey-goosey. I don't think it's going to create perfectly balanced fair fights. But, I mean, do we really expect it to? And once the teams are ready, they are positioned in the antechambers ready to fight. You can place the Dungeon Master screen across the arena so your opponents can't see who is on your team or how you are positioning them. Finally, the double doors are opened and the Defender team will take the first turn. And you play Hero Quest. On your turn, you can pick one of your characters that doesn't have an activation token on it. You can fight then move or move then fight. Sounds familiar. After doing that, the character gains an activation token and play passes to your opponent who also activates a single character. This continues back and forth until all characters have activated. Note that if one side has more characters, this could lead to them activating several characters consecutively once their opponent has run out of moves. And then, after every character has activated, all the activation tokens are removed and a new round begins, with the defender activating first again. If at any point there is only one character left on the team, they get a bit of a boost. As they are emboldened by the cheering crowd, in addition to taking their regular activation each round, they can take a bonus activation after each of their opponent's turns. The bonus activation can be used to move up to their move value, or make a basic two dice attack against an adjacent foe. This is a neat little catch-up mechanism. An effort, albeit not a particularly sophisticated effort, to prevent runaway leaders from romping home without facing a serious contest. The fact that kind of mechanism was even included genuinely surprised me. There is absolutely more thought put into this little skirmish system than I expected. But I digress. Play continues in rounds, with teams alternating activations until only one team is left standing. And that's it. The end. Only that's not quite it. It could have been it. Avalon Hill could have stuck a pitchfork in it and called it done, but there are some wrinkles in the rules to spice things up. For a start, we have two treasure chests in each arena. A hero orthogonally adjacent to or immediately diagonal to a chest can forego attacking to open the chest by rolling two movement dice. Results will range from setting off a trap to gaining some gold, but one of the most interesting results is finding a bone battle axe. Bone weapons are a new element for this expansion. They function exactly like the normal version of the weapon, but you can't sell them. Much more interesting than that, though, are the trophy tokens. If a character ends their turn on a trophy token, they automatically collect it, and it gets added to a pool of tokens for use by anybody on that character's team when a suitable occasion arises. And it doesn't say in the rules you have to reveal what the tile is to your opponent when you first acquire it, making this a nice way to add a little bit of gotcha gameplay, which is often really important for skirmish games. Most of the trophies are combat tiles, and a character is allowed to discard one after seeing the result of their combat roll to modify the result. A trophy with a skull adds one skull to an attack. A trophy with a skull and a times two symbol will add two skulls to an attack. Yeah, I'm not sure why anyone would make the choice to use a times 2 icon to mean add 2 to a result. I'm sure many players would expect it to mean double the number of skulls rolled. But anyway, same thing for the shield trophies. 
you can discard one shield trophy after making the defend roll to modify the result. Some trophies give you one extra shield, and others give you two extra shields. Some of the trophies are healing potions. You can discard one of these to regain two body points on one character. If a character is reduced to zero body points, they are allowed to immediately use a potion trophy to avoid death if their team has one. Finally, we have the Repost trophy. If a character suffers damage from an attacker who is orthogonally adjacent or immediately diagonal to them, then that character can discard a Repost trophy to immediately attack back. They can do this even if the original attack killed them, making mutual destruction possible as two fighters go down swinging together. While each trophy has a specific purpose, it is also possible to discard any trophy tile at any time to grant a character a burst of speed. They are allowed to immediately add two squares to their movement. For the most part, I would expect players are better off using trophies for their intended purpose, but it is good to see this kind of rule, which adds additional decision points and grants the players more flexibility. But that really is your lot. And it's pretty cool. It's still Hero Quest. It's still that really quick, accessible combat system we know and love, but it's just a little bit extra now. To be honest, I would be quite happy to see the trophy system integrated into regular gameplay. Dice mitigation isn't all that common in Hero Quest. You will often get the chance to roll more dice, and you will very, very occasionally get the chance to re-roll a dice, but to have a discardable token in hand that adds a fixed number of skulls or shields to your roll, a resource to combat the fickle whims of fate, is a major development. That's breaking new ground, pushing the envelope, moving the needle. It's something new, and that's a very good reason to be excited. Ultimately, I think Avalon Hill have done wonders here. They have taken what was an intentionally simple combat system, and they have managed to elevate it just enough to make it an amusing diversion. It works well as part of the Against the Ogre Horde questline, where it doesn't outstay its welcome, and it stands up as a quick filler game in its own right. No, of course you are not going to get a deep and satisfying skirmish experience. If you play games like God Tier and Unmatched, even Funkoverse, the Hero Quest Arena mode is not going to scratch that same itch. It's never going to be in the same league as a skirmish game that was built from the ground up to be a skirmish game. But if you're waiting for the last member of your party to arrive for games night, or you have half an hour left at the end of a session, well, you've already got your HeroQuest miniatures and dice on the table, so why not set up the arena, pick a team, and settle some old scores in a new way? Let me know your thoughts in the comments because that is it from me for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please consider pressing the like button. If you really like this video, please consider subscribing if you don't already do so. And hopefully, I will see you all again very soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.